I guess this is the first time we've heard from your company uh, at our conference. Uh, heard from Musk a number of times and from some other people over the years, uh, but this is the first we've heard from you. Now, your company, though, of all the so-called new space companies is, is really only two that have created an operational launch capability, SpaceX and uh, Rocket Lab. And uh, so far, uh, as I understand, you only have a small launcher, but you have a medium lift launcher that is getting ready uh, to go uh, on its first flight. Uh, but anyway, let's start at the beginning. Mm. Uh, you, unlike Musk or Bezos, you were a working engineer and you managed to get investment to create your company. That is, you didn't use it with a few of your $100 billion. To, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the old fashioned way. Yeah. So t t tell us about the origin of Rocket Lab. Yeah, so I mean, look, I started the company down in New Zealand in 2006, and um, we launched a, a first sounding rocket um, in 2009. And then I went to Silicon Valley in, in 2013, and, um, and that, that's where we, we raised the first capital for the Electron program, um, you know, a, a small orbital class vehicle, uh, and, and became a US company at, at, at that point in time. Um, and yeah, I, I guess, uh, you, you know, our, our journey was quite a lot different. Um, you know, uh, we, we raised venture capital and, um, and, and, you know, funded the program that way and then ultimately, uh, you know, listed on, on, on the NASDAQ uh, last year. So, um, so yeah, no, we, 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 uh, we often joke that, um, you know, that this is a, a non-billionaire funded uh, um, space company for sure. Right. Well, you've outperformed several billionaire-funded space programs. <laughs> um, That's very kind. The, okay. Um, the, the, so the, the, first you did the sounding rocket, and then you, your first orbital launch rocket was called the uh, Electron. Correct. Uh, so tell us about the Electron. Yeah, so, so the way to think about Electron is, is um, you know, our friends over at SpaceX took um, what used to be a $300 million launch and brought it down to you know, $60, $90 million, depending on the mission. We kind of did the same for small launch. So, um, you know, if you had a small dedicated payload that, that you had to get to a particular orbit on a particular time frame, you had a Minotaur or a Pegasus or some, something like that, and it was sort of a $50 million price tag. And we took it down to sort of $7.5 million or thereabouts, um, you know, for, for Electron. So, uh, you know, we like to say that SpaceX disrupted the large launch, you know, large launch scale market, and, and we, we did the same down in the small launch. Um, and as you point out, um, you know, we, we're now kind of also looking to, to you know, to move into, into the, the medium and large launch uh, and apply all the lessons we've learned um, from from operating a, 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 you know, a launch vehicle in a company to, you know, to that, to that vehicle to create even more capabilities and, and more options for, you know, for folks. All right. But Electron, okay, so, uh, Okay, I know a little bit about it, but would like to uh, people here probably would would like to know some stuff. It was about 150 kilograms to orbit, and uh, you've used it to launch a, a large number of very small satellites. Yeah, so uh, we can actually lift 320 kgs to a, to a low Earth orbit. Um, and, oh, really? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And we've got number 32 uh, sitting on the pad right now. So it's actually the, the second most frequently launched US rocket um, behind our friends at SpaceX. So we launch a bunch, we're pretty much on a, on a monthly cadence. Um, this year we were able to demonstrate two launches 15 days apart. Uh, every 20 days or less there's a rocket roll off the production line in the factory. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's become the workhorse of, of, that, of that small launch, you know, dedicated um, market. Um. Of like six U CubeSats, this sort of stuff. No, we don't really. F we fly very few CubeSats. Um, generally, they're they're sort of one or two hundred kg, um, you know, dedicated um, spacecraft. Um, you know, ranging from missions for the NRO uh, through to um, you know th through through to smaller missions, of of, of course. But uh, we put some one hundred and fifty satellites in orbit now. Um, but generally, I would say the majority of our customers are sort of that in that one to two hundred kg class of microsatellite or um, small satellite, right. uh, very capable machines um, uh, in, in, in doing important science. 
Um, you know, the one we just launched uh, a week or so ago was, the, you know, uh, General Atomics Argos um, satellite, which is obviously for wildlife monitoring. Um, so, yeah, g generally one or two satellites um, uh, on, on board each mission. Right. Now, you've um, followed the SpaceX model of developing your own engines as opposed to trying to buy them from vendors at uh, significant markup. Um, the, and so you had, uh, what was it, the Rutherford engine in the Electron? And, uh, and as I understand it, unlike most liquid-fueled engines, you didn't use uh, combustion to drive the pumps, you used uh, electric motors? Yeah, that, that's um, correct. I mean, um, we, we've very vertically integrated across the whole, um, you know, the, the whole supply chain. Um, and uh, it's literally raw materials in one door and rocket out the other. Um, you know, we, we 3D print all of our rocket engines. We've put, you know, over 300 rocket engines into space now. Um, and as you say, we, we chose a different cycle, not to try and innovate for the sake of innovating, but on a small launch vehicle, um, propellant margins or propellant residuals are everything. Um, so if you, if you leave 20 kgs behind um, in a propellant residual in an upper stage, um, and you only carry 300 kgs of payload, that's, that's a significant, significant deficit in your payload. So the really hard thing about small launch vehicles are actually uh, managing propellant residuals, and the electric pump enables you to, uh, to really effectively do that uh, because you can continually change your oxygen fuel ratio and, and you know, close that loop. Um, and also, uh, you can consume all of your propellants because you don't need to worry about turbines overspinning or you know, shutting down ox rich or, or fuel rich. Does it also make the engine highly throttleable? Very throttleable, yeah, yeah, incredibly okay. throttleable, in, infinitely throttleable, in fact. Right. So now the Electron is just an expendable launch vehicle, um, but if it's extremely throttleable, could it be made into a reusable launch vehicle? Yeah, it is actually uh, a reusable launch vehicle. We're, we're um, our approach is slightly different. Um, we we catch it mid-air with a helicopter, which I know sounds slightly unconventional um, but uh, you know we're <clears throat> we're in the final the final stages of of, of that program so we've we've, we've bought um, five of them now from space generally we splash them down um, the last recovery mission we, we actually did capture it with a helicopter we subsequently let it go uh, but there's a mission coming up here pretty shortly um, that we'll announce um, where we will have another go so it was really the learnings from the recoverability and reusability program from Electron that has enabled us to move so confidently into the, the Neutron, which is our larger launch vehicle program. Uh, let me ask you a different question, though, uh, deviating a bit. Uh, yeah. the, the Electron engine, the Rutherford engine, what's the thrust, what are the propellants? It's, it's, it's Lox Kero and you know, around about uh, five to 6,000 uh, pounds of thrust, so a pretty, pretty small engine in, in that respect. Right. Um, but if it's that small and if it's incredibly throttable, have you thought about proposing it for use in a lunar lander? <laughs> yeah, we, we've had many a folk uh, come to us for that, uh, for, for, for sure. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the only challenge, of course, is it's, it's an oxygen, uh, liquid oxygen engine, so you've, you've got cryogens to, to deal with um, as opposed to kind of storables. Um, so th there's an extra element. Uh, but, but yes, it has been considered for, for that. Um, but the the probably you know the more the more relevant thing in that respect is our upper stage um, photon satellite or or kick stage, um, you know that that is a on orbit storable really high performance stage um, that you know we delivered the the capstone mission to the moon for NASA here um, a few months ago, and I guess one one of the, the, the cool things about Electron and, and that that coupling with the photon spacecraft is that it enables like super low cost um, interplanetary and deep space missions. I mean, the, the capstone mission to the moon that we flew for, for, for NASA, you know, our launch part of that um, involved, you know, launching of Electron and then our Photon spacecraft spent, you know, uh, seven days in orbit doing these very, very delicate and fine orbit raising maneuvers, um, you know, to, to ultimately end up um, placing the NASA's capstone spacecraft on a, on a, on a TLI to the moon. And mm -hmm. why that's why that's kind of relevant and cool, especially in this in this kind of forum, is that you know that that was a ten million dollar mission. Um, so for ten million dollars, we, we we sent you know we, we delivered a a dedicated mission on a TLI to the moon, and that photon spacecraft that we developed is 
is, is completely capable of going to Venus, going to Mars. Um, in fact, you know, I know this is a I know this is this is strictly a Mars event, so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tread very cautiously about talking about Venus. But um, nothing in the a, universe is foreign to us. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we, we have a private mission to Venus here using that 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 capability, where um, we, we will actually go and and attempt to, um, to to sample Venus's atmosphere. Uh, you know, we're working with Sarah Sager and, and her team to uh, as a life finding mission. But I mean, uh, we have you know that, that spacecraft has the capability to, to to venture you know to these destinations for just an extraordinarily low price and. The cap, you know, the, the the mission to the moon for NASA was really exciting. But to me, what was more exciting is that we created a capability for space science to do frequent and uh, you know affordable missions to, to to Mars, to Venus, to you know to the near their planets, near Earth planets, and, and and asteroids. So, tell us a bit about that Venus mission. Well, I mean, look, uh, um, you know. Uh, not playing favourites with planets, but I, 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 I'm, I'm really very fascinated with Venus. I think it's an incredible analogy to to, to Earth in, in many ways, and um, you know Mars has the 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 attraction that you can put boots on the ground in Mars. Like we we can put footprints on Mars and 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 create um, you know sustaining civilization there in time. Uh, Venus, we're just not going to. There's going to be no, no, no footprints on Venus, um, which uh, which makes it a very, very difficult planet. Um, and I think for that, one, one of one of the reasons why it hasn't been studied, perhaps at, at, at the same level, is is, is because of that. But um, you know, if we look at Venus's atmosphere, there is there is some regions in there that that hold hope that there could be um, some markers of life. And I don't know. I mean, I, I got into the, what the the youngest memory I have actually of of my youngest space memory is is standing outside with my father at the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand in a freezing cold night, and I don't know how old I was, but single digits, and him pointing out to me in the sky that that all the stars in the sky were were suns and and the most probable planets around those those suns, and there could be somebody looking back at me. And I always found that it was it was it's thoroughly unacceptable that we still haven't answered, you know, from a scientific standpoint, you have you have to say that we are the only life in the universe because we haven't conclusively we haven't proven otherwise, right? So, uh, although statistically I think it, it's pretty well accepted that there's there's the probability of life outside us is pretty high, but until you prove it, it's kind of it's un it's it, you can't you can't stand behind that statement. So. Um, you know, I always, I just felt that, you know, we, we have a rocket, we have a spacecraft, we have an ability to actually go and search for life. And it would be pretty rude if you have all that capability to do that and you don't give it a crack. So, you know, we have this private mission that's that's done in nights and weekends. Um, it's got, you know, philanthropic funding behind it uh, where we're going to try and just Get get to the atmosphere in Venus and and with a with a nephlometer and let's let's see if we can we can make some discoveries. Right now, that mission is going to send a probe into Venus's atmosphere. It's going to come down with a parachute, slow through the atmosphere, right? Uh, no, there's no there's no actually there's no parachute. It's just a ballistic entry. We get about 210 seconds in the sweet zone, um, so it's a it's a it's a you know a very very simplified mission in that respect. Really. Uh, why didn't you use a balloon? You could have floated for weeks in Venus's atmosphere. Well, I mean, uh, yes, there's lots of engineering solutions that are far superior. But it's 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 kind of um, what what have we got, and what is the minimum viable um, uh, the minimum viable product that we can we we can we can deliver. Um, so uh, you know, I would I would love nothing more than a, a large program where we could we could we could send significant mass there and spend some time. But uh, when when you're doing it with uh, you know spare qual parts um, and and kind of philanthropic uh, philanthropic adventure, um, you know uh, it, it's a, it's a high risk mission um, that that uh, you know I, th I think is it's important to try. But um, by no means is it is it optimized from by both a scientific and engineering point of view. Uh, you've just cut out there, Robert. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. Yep. All right. So um, uh, I actually do a certain amount of ballooning. And, um, well, you could have a, a, a very easily an extended duration balloon mission on Venus. And one of the more attractive ones uses uh, uh, solar balloons, basically hot air balloons with a vent valve at the top. You can go up, yep. you can go down, you can do all sorts of things. Um, have a real good time. Um, and perhaps after this mission, you'll think about a mission like that. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that after this mission, we inspire a whole bunch of missions back. Um, you know, part of this is proving that it can be done, and um, it would be great if if you found just enough enough uh, enough you know science that that made it uh, tantalizingly interesting to cause plenty more missions to return. Yeah, so let's talk about the neutron. Uh, this rocket is in development right now. Um, t t tell the people here about it. Yeah, so it's it's a it's it's kind of based on the learnings of of, a, of electron, um, and uh, you know it, it, it delivers 13 tons uh, to orbit in a, in a reusable manner, uh, slightly less if we if we land it back at the launch range. Uh, it's look, it's a it's a reusable um, uh, first stage, uh, expendable second stage. And um, and you know we, we, we think um, you know it's going to be an incredibly uh, important tool um, in you know in the launch toolbox. Um, it, it's it's got some unique uh, functionality and features. I mean, if you look at it, it kind of looks a little bit funny. Um, that's because it's, I think it's, it looks great, actually. <laughs> I, I think it looks a lot better than a Falcon Nine. It's, it's shaped more properly. Well, I mean, uh, sorry, it's it, it, it's that shape because it's optimized to go up just as much as, as it's optimized to go down. And mm -hmm. uh, you know when when you actually uh, when you actually start with a clean sheet of paper to design a vehicle that is that is primarily designed to do that, um, then then that's what you end up with. Like you know, a, 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 it's a very wide wide and, and large diameter first stage. Um, and the, the primary reason for that is is that um, you know w one of the biggest challenges for reusability, of course, is reentry. And you know, re reusability is a thermal problem, not a not necessarily a control problem. So the best way to to, um, to to deal with a thermal problem is not have a thermal problem. So um, if you have a, a you know a very very high drag area with a very very low mass, then um, you know the, the stage decelerates and you know the heating energy is is significantly kind of reduced and controlled. So um, it, it it makes um, you know and, and of course if you don't have to deploy legs and you don't have mechanisms and the wide base also helps you out for for those particular things. So you know it's it's very much optimised um, for for reusability. Um, Seventy percent of the cost of a rocket is in the first stage. So if you look at the the difference in size between the first stage and the second stage, you can see that the first stage is optimised to do a lot of work. So we don't separate off the second stage until you know until we're out of well and truly out of the soup, um, sort of 100 kilometres um, you know in, in altitude. And if you look at the second stage, it looks disproportionately small to the first stage. Um, and the challenge with the second stage is it, is it has competing kind of competing requirements. Uh, it needs to be the most highest performance stage, but because it's not reusable, it also needs to be the lowest cost. So the more energy you can put into your first stage and get it back, the better off you are. So uh, hence, you know, that the fairings on neutron open up, and we 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 kind of eject out the the second stage and the payload, and then the fairings close again, and then we land. Because we want the first stage, um, you know, to, to be as reusable as possible. We don't want to be gathering fairings up, you know, downrange. Right. So this is a methane oxygen uh, vehicle, uh, both stages. Yep, and uh, and what's the fairing size? It's a five point five meter fairing. So with five you know, and a standard. half meter. Yeah. Okay. The standard. All right, and it's got this gaping mouth thing. But um, there's no, a James really Bond movie where someone has one of those in orbit that yeah, yeah. swallows up a capsule and brings them home. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, I'd never seen that until we released the, um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the video of how Neutron was going to work and then I was inundated with, uh, with, with that particular meme. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, cause it's perfect. Um, the, uh, and so 13 tons to orbit, it's, uh, so it's quite competitive with, you're, you're now going to be competing directly against Falcon 9. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, we, we think that is a that that's an interesting place to be, um, and uh, I, th I think um, you know there's 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 clearly a lot of 
demand around that, that kind of mass. And it's, it's a very useful mass for doing um, mega constellation work as, as well as interplanetary and as well as human spaceflight. So it's kind of that, that sweet, spot, sweet spot where you get um, all the kind of elements um, in, a, in, a, in a vehicle size that's kind of optimised. It's, it's, it certainly can't do very large missions, um, but the, the, the cost you bear in building a vehicle that can do very large missions for the, the relatively small number of them, you know, economically and, and both from an engineering stance, it, 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 you know, it's, it, I think we, we believe we've found the kind of the optimised point. Um, history will prove us right or wrong, of course. Well, it's certainly a very popular point for launch vehicles historically. Um, the the uh, and w what do you anticipate the cost of a, a, a Neptune launch is going to be? Well, I mean, look, the, the, the reality is that building a building a launch vehicle is a, is a is an undertaking that that results in significant grey hairs um, or loss of hair. So you wouldn't you wouldn't embark on it unless you felt that you could be competitive in in, in the marketplace. Otherwise, it would be a completely pointless exercise. So um, one of the, one of the true advantages of of building a small launch vehicle first is that um, there's so many elements of a launch vehicle that don't scale with the size of the launch vehicle. For example, like flight safety analysis in, in your flight safety team. It doesn't matter if you're flying a, a 20 ton vehicle or a 200 kg vehicle. The flight analysis and the flight safety analysis is the same, um, you know, and th that goes along with even manufacturing. Like, if if you're if you're a technician on the shop floor assembling a two-inch valve or a twelve-inch valve, it takes the same amount of labour. Like, it doesn't. There's a lot of things that don't actually scale. So, by developing a small launch vehicle first, and kind of going back to your, your initial point of doing it commercially, uh, make, having you know making sure the books have to close then you're forced to, to, to really optimise and really think very, very hard about how, how you develop these systems and how you develop these teams. I mean, we can't afford to have a 100-person flight safety team, um, so we have to automate um, all of those functions and, and amortise you know, all of those, those overheads, if you will, into a, a rocket cost of $7.5 million. So we've become very, very good at automating things and very, very good at being highly efficient at doing all of the, the kind of the periphery stuff uh, around a launch vehicle. And by the way, that periphery stuff is actually the majority of the cost. Okay. Now, uh, it's a methane oxygen engine. Uh, I think you call it Archimedes. Okay. And has maybe 120,000 pounds of thrust, something like that. Yep. Um, now, as you may know, I, I've been a champion of methane oxygen propulsion for a real long time. Um, and it was the basis of my Mars Direct plan, because uh, methane oxygen is the easiest propellant to make on Mars, mm -hmm. and to use it for return. And um, one uh, disagreement I've had with uh, Musk about his version of that plan is that he's using starships to come back from Mars, which is... Uh, very problematical to have to refuel an ascent vehicle that is so massive. Uh, have you looked at all into the possibilities of altering uh, the neutron to be used as a Mars Earth return vehicle? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I have I have not. Um, you know, we 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 we're certainly making sure that it it is is human rateable. That is for sure. Um, and we did a, a not an announcement of a capsule. Um, uh, you know, a few few weeks ago, where we just kind of laid out, well, if we were to do a capsule, this is generally what what it, what it would look like. But I think there's a lot, a lot of missions um, that that uh, that you could open up for sure um, with with that kind of class and, and scale of um, of vehicle. But I can't I can't say I've, I've thought of that one uh, to you, okay. you know to date. All right, not today. Um, well, it's a suggestion. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, um, so. Uh, one thing about um, the SpaceX is that they're developing a whole bunch of uh, how can I put, orbital capabilities of their own on orbit, that it's not just a delivery system, that they're doing mm. the Starlink. In other words, they're, they're creating orbital enterprises supported by their launch vehicles. Um, do you have plans along those lines or uh, better lines? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, our space systems division, which is our, the division that builds satellites and spacecraft, is bigger than our launch division. Um, so uh, I think most people know us as the little rocket company. Um, 
and perhaps you know in hindsight I should have called the company something different um, than, than Rocket Lab because it, it tends to tends to draw people's focus on the launch piece. But uh, but like I say, I mean uh, you know our, our space systems business by 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 every metric is larger than our launch business. Um, and you know we're we're building some uh, some super cool uh, spacecraft and involved in some really cool missions. So you know obviously we have the Escapade mission um, for NASA. Uh, you know the, the the two the two spacecraft that are going to orbit um, orbit Mars in 2024. Uh, we have we have commercial customers. We were doing um, reentry um, you know of capsules for them. Uh, we have the Global Star contract, which is um, which is providing connectivity uh, for for mobile devices. Um, so yeah, no, uh, I, I think my, my we we we're definitely an end-to-end -end space company, and and you know I've I've been very clear in, in in my view that I think that the you know the large space companies of the future are going to be end-to-end -end space companies because when you have launch, you've basically got the keys to space. Um, if you have uh, a satellite you know division, then you can build the infrastructure. It's fairly fairly logical step that once you can launch the infrastructure, build the infrastructure, that you would operate the infrastructure. So um, you know our, our approach is a little bit more kind of steady and and, and methodical in, in that sense, and we're not pushing all the chips, and we're not certainly not pushing the chips of the company you know, into the middle on one particular application. But right now, right now, we're very very happy to you know supply and support everybody's everybody else's application. Um, but you know, it, we've, we've made no secret in the future that um, you know we, we intend to uh, provide a service of, of some sort. Okay. Any thoughts about uh, orbital research labs, space stations, things of this nature? E everything's on the table. Everything's on the table. Um, you know, I like to finish one thing before I start the next. Um, so you know, right now our focus is on uh, you know getting neutron to the pad. And uh, we, you know, like I mentioned, we've got a, a lot of really complicated um, space space systems missions to deliver. So, um, yeah, well, not one one step at a time. All right. So, speaking of getting neutron to the pad, when's that going to happen? Yeah, we're trying to get something on the pad by 2024. Um, and you know, it, it sounds an ambitious an ambitious goal. And and, and look, truly, it is. Um, however, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that um, you know that are, are just directly come across from electron. For example, um, you know, like avionics are, you know, rocket scale agnostic. So, you know, we can we, we're at a huge advantage where we can take all of the avionics flight computers, um, you know, uh, distribution nodes, everything, over from Electron and, and put them directly on Neutron, and you know, all of the software, uh, you know, code base that that, that goes with that. Um, you know, we, we have a, a giant head start in, in reusability um, from all the learnings we've had by re-entering Electrons. Um, so you know, I think I think we're in a in a good place, um, having having executed and, and and done this before to to meet that. Um, but you know, we're 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 certainly pushing hard. That is for sure. Okay, and and to be clear, the Venus mission is going to be flown by the Electron, not it's Correct. not waiting for the Neutron. Correct. Okay, and so using the photon, you are sending how much mass on trans uh, Venus injection? Yeah, the probe's about 40 kgs, so we can we can get about 40 kgs, um, you know, into Venus's atmosphere. So you'd probably be able to do almost that much into Mars's atmosphere. Yes, 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 yep, yep. Okay, so, um, which doesn't sound a lot, but actually, you know, the nephlometer that we're flying, I think it weighs 900 grams. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the majority of the mass is actually in the heat shield um, uh, and, and in, you know, in, in the radio. So, but, but mainly in structures, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, you, you, can, you can do something pretty significant. And if, you, if you're not actually entering something in the atmosphere, then, uh, and you just want to orbit the photon, then you've got, you know, a 40 kg payload, which you can do a lot with 40 kgs um, of, of actual payload mass, yeah. Right, so you could do a... a, a robotic Mars mission with a electron <laughs> launch you're saying those are like seven million dollars each or something or whatever they yeah were. yeah yeah so I mean like I say we, we did the, the mission to the moon for 10 million dollars now um, and full disclosure I don't think we'll do that again but uh, you can see the order of magnitude it's it's you know we've, we've taken missions that would be hundreds of millions and turned them into tens of millions yeah no that's the very interesting indeed um, so um, uh, I think I'd like to open it up to questions from people here. If you don't mind? Sure. Uh, so I'll just call on people. 
Uh, and then if someone can, can move around with a mic, let's take this gentleman over here uh, with the blue shirt. I want you to get him. I see. Thank you. Um, what lessons in manufacturability are you carrying forward from electron to neutron second stage to ensure that it has a high production rate and can guarantee a high flight rate? Are there any fixed set of lessons that you really think are going to be embodied in neutron second stage? Oh my God. I, I reckon you could write a book on that. And the lessons are, the lessons are hard. Um, so I, I think, it, look, I used to think that getting your first rocket to orbit was the hard part. That is so much simpler than, than doing it over and over again. Like, it, it's, it's, I would say it's somewhere between a 10 and a 100 time factor of, of, of complexity going from your first rocket to rocket number 20. Um, and, you know, the answer to the question is, is, is absolutely yes. Um, you know, the, the, there's one, there's one, as I mentioned before, there's one rocket rolling off the production line every 20 days, you know, right now with Electron. And, um, the, you know, the, the approach we took with the upper stage uh, is, um, ironically, in the space industry, uh, it's, it's not very common, but in the aviation industry, it's, it's common as it's common as mud, which is automated, automated, you know, fibre placement. So basically, uh, call it a, a five-axis robot with a composite um, placement head on it. So what that enables you to do is put down, you know, literally metres a minute of, of carbon um, down onto the mould, and uh, and you can, you know, cure and coke. Co you know, co-cure a tank in, in a ridiculously short amount of time. And, you know, composites get a, get a bit of a hard rub because the, the cost per kg is expensive, and that, that, that is true. Uh, but actually, if you, if you analyse um, the, the cost of building a rocket, the raw materials account for a very small amount of it. It's, it's kind of the, the, the labour and the overhead actually account for the majority of it. So automating that, you know, makes a huge difference. Um, and then, you know, the way that the upper stage is, is designed is, is kind of, we, we, were, we, were, we were faced with this quandary, right, where you, you, need, you need the highest performance in that stage, but it also has to be the lowest cost, and generally those two things don't go together. Um, so the way that this, the, the upper stage is actually works in, in Neutron is it's, is it's hung from the payload plate. So all of the upper stage um, below the payload plate is, is kind of, is, is hung and in, in is, you know, is in tension. So you know, normally you, you sandwich your, your upper stage and it's in compression, you've got to deal with all these bending loads and, and, and whatnot. Um, whereas by putting it inside the, the first stage, you know, taking the load path directly from the payload out to the structural walls of the first stage um, and just hanging that second stage, it basically means is that the, the, the second stage is extremely light, like the structures are extremely light. So think of like a centaur, which is extremely light, in very thin stainless steel. Um, and then you swap out the stainless steel for carbon, which is a quarter of the mass, um, and you know, and, and, and a high specific strength. So you end up with an upper stage that is that is just you know from a mass to mass to you know, you know a performance of, of propellant to mass ratio just really really exceptional. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, someone question over here, I believe. Hi. Uh, how important is young talent access to young talent with like specific skills and experience uh, when you're doing things like uh, re full reusability or partial or reusability and then complicated liquid engine maneuvers, things like that? Yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I think it, that 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 doesn't. That's not just specific to to those particular applications. Like access to talent, I think it, e everyone will tell you that um, that that is that is a huge challenge, and uh, and you know. Um, what what a time to be alive to be an aerospace and space engineer like this is this is the best time, and um, you know uh, keep, keeping the machine fed of of um, of really really good talent is, um, is 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 probably the thing I toss and turn at night the most about. Um, make make no mistake, the bar to get in at Rocket Lab is extraordinarily high, um, and we're we're very 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 fussy. Um, but you you can kind of bury your head in the sand and 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 complain, or you can do something about it. So, you know, we invested really heavily into education programs. Um, you know, we've been around 100 and well, it's nearly probably 200 schools now. Uh, we have apprenticeship programs, um, scholarships, PhDs, um, and we found that actually the most effective way to, to, to bring young people into the industry was not go to high schools, uh, because by the time they've gone to high schools, kind of 
two things have happened. Um, either their dreams have been crushed or their dreams have been set. And um, uh, you, go, you go to primary schools and that's where you can actually, um, that's where you can actually have the biggest impact for, you know, from, from young kids deciding to pursue a career in, in STEM or engineering or, 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 any, or anything, or any of the sciences. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time in primary schools and it's a long, look, it's a, it's a long term bet. Um, but you know, after, after you know, five or six years of doing that, we're starting to see the, the benefits. Okay, next question. Uh, let's have uh, th this fellow over here. Hi, uh, Steli Ford Mundow. Um, so would you ever consider selling a neutron rocket, say Carl Icahn buys the space station and wants to have a dedicated rocket for private flights up there? Is that something you guys would consider? Um, and do you, have you guys entertained any discussions about dedicated rockets for specific projects? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, look, we're, uh, we're, we're totally in the business of selling rockets. Um, uh, we, we, we certainly wouldn't, you know, fist one over to somebody and say, here you go. Um, we, we'd love, happy, happy to do a, happy to do, you know, to do a service. And, um, uh, you know, we, we definitely, um, you know, we, you know, pe customers come to us directly to, to do their missions. So there is no middleman between us and the customer. Um, so th this is a fairly, th this is the way we kind of operate as a customer will come to us with a particular mission and, and we'll, we'll um, you know, we, we will deliver that mission for them uh, in, in, in that sense. Um, but, uh, but I mean, as far as kind of non-space companies and, and kind of um, missions, uh, we, we, we've done that before uh, as well. I mean, um, we, we've, we've launched, uh, you know, non kind of non-traditional um, you know, space companies and, and got their payloads to orbit and, and, as well historically. Uh, hello, I have a related question. So who should we contact if we have a mission proposal? Well, if, if it's anything to do with Venus, contact me. Um, but but if it's, if it's, if it's uh, to do with any other planet than Venus, um, so uh, the best person to contact is, is Richard French um, at Rocket Lab. So it'll be r.french um, at uh, rocketlabusa.com. So R Richard is, um, you know, leads up a, um, a lot of those mission formulations and uh, uh, he'll, he'll be super excited. Okay. Any other questions? Other questions? Uh, we have one over here. Uh, I was wondering what made you choose to make it to open for the second stage? What made you choose that? Because using more uh, moving parts could result in greater chance of like a failure. I presume this, this is with respect to the opening fairings. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, like a, a, a rocket is a giant engineering trade, just as a spacecraft is a giant engineering trade. And you're trading off um, the, the, the kind of um, uh, the, the cost and, and complexity of recovering fairings versus just keeping them on. Um, and the reality is that, uh, you know, when we actually open those fairings, we're, we're through the soup, you know, we're at an altitude where, uh, where you know, aerodynamics and heating is, is no longer, uh, you know, a, a, a force that matters. Ironically, the, the, the most challenging force we have on the fairings um, when they're open is the speed in which we need to open them and close them and um, do the rotational uh, burn back maneuver to get the, the, you know, the vehicle uh, clear of the second stage and heading in the right direction for reusability. So the highest load case on those fairings is actually opening and closing and, um, and, uh, and, and the boost back, uh, not, not, not actually the ascent. But I take your point, uh, the, more, the more parts you've got um, moving, then the, the, the more possibility of, of failure. But um, in this particular case, the, 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 the gains that are, that are realised from, from that particular actuation um, are just too immense to, to not solve that problem. Okay, over there. There was an early concept from SpaceX called Dragon Lab, which was the idea of an unmanned, long-duration crew capsule with no crew on board for mm. you know, pressurised experiments and anything. Is there any thought on when, especially during the early testing, when you're not going to actually physically send people up there to do any kind of long duration um, lab work with your yeah. You know, crew capsule? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, well, there wasn't. Maybe there is now. Um, <laughs> but but um, I would I would say that that we, we kind of do that a little bit with Electron. So Electron's upper stage or its kick stage. 
uh, you know, it, it can be turned into a satellite itself. Um, so we have had missions in the past where we've launched a customer's satellite to orbit and then, uh, you know, once, once the customer satellite is in orbit, we, we literally turn on our, upper, or our, our kick stage and, and it transitions into a satellite. Um, and we've used that internally for actually developing our own technology, you know, uh, getting, getting time on, on new, new kind of spacecraft and, and satellite developments. Um, so, and, and you know, the photon, um, that lunar photon that we, we went to the moon with, um, you know, that, that's a, it, it's a blurry line between what is a rocket and what is a spacecraft at that point because it also forms part of the upper stage. Um, so there's, that would be a, you know, a, a fairly, a fairly small scale, of course, but, but way of, of, of um, kind of doing a, a very, very low cost, um, very low cost lab for sure. Over there. Hi. Um, when you, back when you ate your hat for the announcement <laughs> of Neutron, um, I was wondering, you, you said that Archimedes was designed to be sort of intentionally simple. Yep. Um, has your philosophy around that changed at all since then? Absolutely not. So, uh, and, but I, I, you know, um, we, we have had a, a cycle change from, from a, a gas generator cycle to, a, you know, a stage combustion, Oxford uh, stage combustion. So uh, that, 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 may, that may kind of sound like another hat-eating moment. Um, but the only reason we changed that architecture is because we found that um, the requirements of the, of the upper stage engine were such that it requires, you know, very deep throttling. Um, and by the time, uh, you know, GGs are, are, are great cycles, but, you know, methane makes it even more, more challenging um, for, for, for kind of that cycle and deep, deep throttling uh, for both um, throttling down for upper stage, light upper stage payloads doing interplanetary work and also, you know, the landing engine. So we actually found that we ended up in a position where, um, you know, the turbine temperature of the GG cycle was just pushing right up against, um, you know, a, a limit and, and wasn't, wasn't, was no longer kind of um, true to the, to, to the philosophy. So as we tried to solve that problem, um, we, we looked at different cycles and, and the, the, you know, the, the stage combustion cycle uh, is a great cycle. It's generally not, you know, synonymous with, um, you know, low stress and low pressures and, 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 and those kinds of things. But actually what we did is, is we took a, you know, a, a very, um, a, you know, a very good cycle and derated it. So, you know, typically if you're running those, those closed combustion cycles, you have very, very high chamber pressures and, and very, very high pump pressures, very high temperatures, very hot oxygen. Well, we said, what happens if we just hold the ISP, the ISP value the same? By the way, it's not, it's not that high because it doesn't need to be high. Um, and, uh, and, and move over to that cycle. And what that results in is actually incredibly cold turbine temperatures, incredibly cold oxygen temperatures, uh, and of course, low chamber pressures, which is, which is kind of all related, uh, and an incredibly reliable engine. Um, so it, it's all about, you know, how do we, how, how do we make the, bo the most boring, the most reliable engine? And, um, and although the cycle is, like I say, synonymous with the opposite of that, actually when you, when you run it, it's, it's literally like, you know, running, running one of those cycles in, in an idle mode um, for, for where we're at. So, uh, you know, strains and longevities, temperatures, all of those things just, just plummet um, into the right, the right zone. Can you describe in a bit more detail the process that you mentioned um, of using helicopters to catch the um, reusable rockets? And also, do you see this being your like long-term uh, solution for reusability? So, uh, absolutely. So for Electron, um, it's a small launch vehicle. And it, I think as I mentioned before, there, there's like there's zero margins in a small launch vehicle. It's an incredibly difficult um, vehicle to, you know, to, to fly. And um, you know, if, if you were to do a propulsive landing in a small launch vehicle, um, you would get no payload to orbit. Uh, so, um, so, so basically you have to let the atmosphere do the work. Um, so for Electron, uh, the really challenging bit for that is actually um, targeting and guiding uh, and controlling the, the, you know, the, the entry dynamic of that stage. So um, we, we, tr we control the, the entry of that stage very, very closely and basically we bring it in engines first because um, obviously there's a, a bit of a heat shield there anyway to deal with the uh, you know, plume plume interactions and flow interactions you get from, from ascent. Um, and if, if you can hold that, that, that angle of attack um, just so, then obviously you have a big bow wave out the front and it pushes everything out the front and you know, the stagnation point is well forward 
And if you can get that forward enough, then you can basically sit in the lee of the flow. Um, and with a carbon composite launch vehicle, you know, the, the tolerance for, for, for really high temperatures is obviously not very high. So you have a very tight corridor to, to guide through. Uh, but if you can pull it off, then you don't need any 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 burns, any you know con, uh, any any control burns or landing burns. You don't need to use any propellant, um, and you basically let the atmosphere do all the work. Um, and of course, you know if you're not landing it, then you need you need to be able to get it somehow. So um, you know putting it under a chute is is the obvious solution. Splashing it down in the ocean works, but then you've just got a whole lot of you know a whole lot of effort in front of you to to clear out all of the salt water and 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 all of that stuff. So the logical decision was like, well, let's not let it touch the let's not let it touch you know the sea. Um, I love helicopters, and um, uh, you know it's the ideal machine for for doing it. And there is a you know, there's a heritage of of that that particular mission. Um, so we started testing it, and we found that we could do it actually really really well. So, um, so th that that was kind of an example of a vehicle that was never designed to be reusable, made reusable. Now, Neutron is a totally different kettle of fish. Um, Neutron Neutron was designed to be reusable from day one. Hence, you see the the difference in in, in design, the difference in aerodynamic surfaces, um, and the difference in in, in even um, in architecture. So, um, you know, Neutron does use propulsive landing. Uh, it's a vehicle of a scale that, that will work through, but it does not have a deceleration burn. Um, we're able to negate the need for that deceleration burn purely through, um, you know, the re-entry dynamics of having a very large ballistic coefficient and very low mass. I have got a, a question. Uh, have you looked at uh, Neutron uh, for surface-to-surface -surface travel on Earth? We have actually, um, and we have a we have a contract with the U.S. government to look just uh, just you know explicitly um, at that. Um, obviously, there needs to be a, a very a very strong justified reason to you know to do that transport because I think that is it's a it's a you know fairly expensive and and, um, and it's, it's certainly a lot riskier than flying in a plane. So yeah, but New Zealand's um, pretty far. Away. Away from here. <laughs> yeah, man. If I if I could get from from New Zealand to the U.S. from launch site to launch site in 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 like a in, in a ballistic arc, that would be awesome. I would love that so much. All right. Well, you need to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, more questions here. Uh, let's get one from over there. Thank you. Um, has there been any work on human rating your vehicles at all? Yeah, so we're, we're designing Neutron to be human rateable. Um, it's not coming out of the out of the chute as as human rated um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, uh, look, you, you just got to fly a whole bunch of cargo first, um, and you know I have just such incredible admiration for an astronaut. Um, I don't think I could ever climb aboard a launch vehicle. I know the failure modes too well. Um, and at the end of the day, you, you know, it, it is an incredibly complex machine, um, and uh, and and you know, you do everything you can, but you have to there's, you have to accept there's, there's there's significant risk there, no matter what you do, and you, you can mitigate it pretty successfully for sure. Um, but you know, we, before we, we before we want to fly any 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 humans, um, I'd like to see a lot of a lot of kind of uh, uh, you know less less precious cargo. Um, First and really, really get the vehicle well buttoned in. So, as as in a, you know, so for logically, um, we, we're we're making it human rateable, and what that means is like, we don't want to go back and requalify all of our tanks and go back and have to change tank wall thicknesses because safety factors aren't where they need to be. So, we're making sure that all of that is built in from day one. But the actual certification process is a massive process. So, um, that's what I mean by making it certifiable, but not certifying it from day one. About right here. Yeah, I'm a scientist oh. who's interested, of course, in the life on Venus question. And of course, we're motivated by Jan Spacek has this carbon cycle mm. on Venus, which leads to glycolic acid and, and, and maybe explains the pale yellow, lemon yellow color that Venus has. I mean, don't worry, your team is working with Jan and it's informing the nephilometer. So 
But I'm concerned, I'm interested about your motivation. So is, is the science fundamentally motivating such that if somebody told you that life definitely does not possibly, could not imaginably exist on Venus and you believe them, which would be a separate point, mm. would that make you less interested in Venus? Oh man, that's a deep question. Um, well, I guess it, it, it would have to. I would be. I, I think I wouldn't be true to myself if I said it. It, it, would, it would have to. I mean, I have, for whatever reason, I just think that's a really, really important question to answer. Um, so if someone else, you know, if, if it was, if it was, if it was answered either way, um, I'd be extraordinarily happy. Now, if I can be a part of that answer, it's neither here nor there. Um, I, I, I think Venus is an interesting planet, other than just you know the the, the fact of, of life. I think it's you know it's an incredibly interesting analog, um, and you know from an atmospheric standpoint, it's just like the the, the more you learn about Venus, you, the more you it's it's just like the definition of of like an alien world. It's it's just super nasty. Um, so so no, I, I definitely I, I definitely think there's a lot to to learn uh, more about Venus. Um, and and I'd, I'd still think you know we need we need irrespective of picking favorite planets I, I think I think we need to do much much more research in you know in, in our solar system and in our planetary bodies and and, and um, yeah either way I think there's there's, there's a tremendous amount that, that that we need to learn so yeah I mean I wouldn't cash in my chips if that's what you mean I would still be I'd still be pretty keen over there. Uh, we all talk about <clears throat> a STEM education, which is both appropriate and, and good, and I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Mm. But in a more practical way, you need people that can do things now. Yeah. Uh, evolving, the evolving industry means that job descriptions and definitions are being firmed up. They're starting to be shared across the, across the industry. So if you were to say, state who, what kind of skills you needed, in the next couple of years, I mean, one or two years, what kind of descriptions would you would you be see, seeking? Yeah, that's that's a really great, a really great question. Um, look, I, I guess for me, what comes first is people's passion and, and, and motivation. I think that 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 always comes first. Uh, we'll look for somebody who's just gone out and done something um, versus somebody who who's done nothing with a with a flawless grade. So. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's just about education. Um, obviously, you need a baseline of, of, of education, you know, to be, you know, to, to be able to be, you know, knowledgeable. Now, nah, even then, I mean, I, I never went to university, um, and uh, there's, there's different ways of obtaining knowledge for sure. But I mean, I, I think the, the priority for us when we're looking at candidates is, is, is motivation and, and, and passion, and, and actually just doing stuff um, is, is number one. But I guess. Um, the, 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 you can pick your field, honestly. Like, if you said there's no one particular field that that we're like massively um, you're flush on. Like, all of the fields um, from you know across our space systems division and, and our launch division, whether it's it's aerodynamicists to structural analysis to, to technicians on the shop floor, um, it's 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 all across you know across the board. And one of the things that we actually find. Um, uh, you know, a stereotype, if you will, is especially in the in the kind of the technician um, environment, is actually convincing people that you can work in this, um, and uh, you know, uh, convincing a technician that, in fact, um, with the right level of, of of training and 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 um, and and support, that 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 they can work in the space industry and work on really really important complex things. So, I think I think some of the some of the workforce. You know, may believe that they're not capable when, when in fact, they you know they, they turn out to be amazing. So I, I know that's not a really great answer to the question, but um, it's a very, very difficult one to answer. And uh, are you hiring? <laughs> yes, we, we are hiring. Yep, RocketLabCareers.com, please. Yep. <laughs> RocketLabCareers.com, kids. There it is. All right, right here. So we, so great for you to be speaking here. Thank you. And we could ask you a million technical questions. Um, I'm, I'm interested in you, the person, the leader. You talked about education. You talked about motivation. Um, but you've had sustained creativity and sustained risk-taking and extraordinary outcomes and success. 
how how do you manage uh, failure as a as a leader, an individual, and as a company and, and cultural? Do you have something cultural that's unique at Rocket Lab that you uh, would like to share with us, or perhaps not share with us? <laughs> well, firstly, your comments are, are, are very kind, but. Um, you know, it, like the cake always looks great when it's presented on a plate, but man, the kitchen's messy. Um, so, um, you know, there's there's a heap of a heap of really you know, challenging things uh, and, and failures along the way. I mean, I think the culture in the company is like the bar is high, as I mentioned, for talent. Um, the culture we have here is is that um, we have everybody's back, and I guess. You know the thing I'm most proud of about about the company, and the, you know, a company or, or is, is not a logo. It's not it's not the CEO. It's not that it, it's it's a collection of amazing people. And the thing I'm most proud about, you know, the company. I think one of the things that's special to us is that when there's a problem and when something goes bad, nobody looks at each other and goes, "Oh, it was their fault" or "It's their fault." Or nobody ducks for cover and looks to hide. Everybody acknowledges that. Okay, that didn't go the way we were expecting it to go. Um, and everybody just jumps in and tries to solve, solve those problems. And you know, if there's a failure in, in avionics, you'll find the software team will be the first team there to you know to help out, or or vice versa am, amongst the company. And I think that that's part of the magic of the company is is that um, we're all passionate people. We all want to see success, and um, we we don't want to see anybody else fail um, within the company. And and you know that that's that that that's pretty special. Uh, Musk has adopted the approach uh, recently of uh, basically mass producing his vehicles uh, before they're even uh, uh, been proven to fly. So his strategy is produce a whole bunch of them, launch them, crash them, fix what that failure was, launch the next one, crash it, fix them, and so forth. Uh, now he can do that because he, he's got deep pockets. Uh, but it also has proven to be uh, a pretty muscular approach to development. Um, do you have anything like that in mind, or, or what's your approach going to be? Yeah, my, my approach is slightly slightly different there, and not to say any any approach is better than the other. Um, but um, you know, we have a fail fast mentality at Rocket Lab. But look, it's at the component level and at the subsystem level. By the time we get to full up assemblies, um, we expect them to work, and um, you know, it, maybe that maybe that philosophy and that approach has been born out of the fact, as you say, it's like if you, you don't have infinite capital, then you don't have in, in, infinite possibilities to, you know, you you, you don't you, you have a finite amount of tries. Um, so mm -hmm. those those tries, you know, be, better be well reasoned. But you know, I've I've found that um, at least in, in, in my experience that. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a right place to fail fast, and like I say, we'll fail fast on, on early concepts and, and things like that, and even early sub-assemblies. Um, but we like to put a lot of kind of, because you can go too far, right? You can you, you can sit and do endless analysis. Um, it's very easy to sit and do endless analysis and, and continue to come up with questions to answer, and at some point you just have to you know say, let's just go and build it and see what we've actually got. And I would say that, you know, if you had to draw, you draw, draw a kind of a line of where we're at, we're probably in the middle of between way too much analysis and no analysis, um, and, and, and study, I should say. So, um, you know, our approach, our approach is different. Whether or not it's, it's better, who knows? Um, but but it's, it's the approach that, that's kind of you know, worked, worked for us. And, and like I say, when we, when we get to, to really expensive big things, we, we really don't like seeing those fail. So finally, because uh, we're almost out of time, uh, when Neutron flies the first time, where is it going to fly from, and will people be able to go there and see it succeed? Yeah, look, it'll fly from the Wallops test facility, um, so that's where we're building the pad, and uh, of course, um, that, that's a great, a great launch site to, um, to, to, to view. Um, I will caution, it's a first flight, so um, you know, all of, all of the risks that's associated with the, with, it, with the first flight. All right. Well, uh, good luck. Um, thank you very much. And once again, it's rocketlabcareers.com. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. That's awesome.